All right, good morning, everyone. My name is Erica Yelensky. I work with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency Pacific Southwest Office in San Francisco, uh, where I work on San Francisco Bay water quality issues, and I'm part of the uh, West Coast Marine Debris Alliance, and I'm here with my co-worker, a colleague, Sherry Lippiat from NOAA. I'll let her introduce herself. Hi, uh, I'm Sherry Lippiat. I'm the California Regional Coordinator for the NOAA Marine Debris Program. Um, today, I'm also representing the West Coast Marine Debris Alliance which is a diverse coordinating body with members from sectors, including state, federal, and tribal government, NGOs, academia, and industry, working together to advance actions that address marine debris on a regional scale. Our objectives include addressing marine debris by identifying gaps, finding funding, sharing information on effective actions, and measuring progress. You can find out more information about the Marine Debris Alliance at marinedebrisalliance.org. Um, with that, I want to thank marinedebris.info for hosting us today and turn it back over to Erica to introduce our speaker. Okay, thanks, Sherry. So I'm excited to introduce Samantha Summer. Uh, she's with Clean Water Fund. She's their Waste Prevention Program Manager and has been with them since 2014. And she's based in Clean Water Fund's uh, Oakland, California office. Prior to joining Clean Water Fund, Samantha was the Community Sustainability Liaison to the City of Santa Monica where she developed recycling outreach material for commercial businesses and multifamily dwellings. And she also served as an adjunct professor in the Recycling and Resource Management Program at Santa Monica College. So today, oh, sorry, so she holds a master's in community and regional development from UC Davis, as well as a degree in environmental studies from UC Santa Cruz. And today, Samantha is going to discuss Rethink Disposable. Uh, this is a program where Clean Water Fund has worked with San Francisco Bay Area stormwater programs and restaurants to implement source reduction strategies, strategies to reduce the amount of single-use disposables entering the environment. So we're really excited to have Samantha here to speak with us. She'll go, her presentation is about 30 minutes long, and after that we'll do Q&A. And as um, audience members, as you have questions, please type them into the chat box on the right-hand side of the screen. And with that, I will hand it over to Samantha. Thanks, Erica, and uh, hello, everyone. And thanks for joining us. And of course, thanks to the West Coast Marine Debris Alliance for the invitation to speak today. Today, I'm going to be talking to you about our source reduction campaign, Rethink Disposable, created and incubated by our Clean Water California office. This campaign takes a pollution prevention approach to stop waste before it starts and inspire the necessary cultural shift away from the single-use disposable throwaway habit by engaging local governments, food businesses and institutions, and customers of takeout food, which is pretty much almost everyone these days. I will take you on a little journey of our story to build an innovative new program from creation through development and implementation, and now to program reflection and expansion. I will primarily be highlighting the work that we're doing with the food businesses. There's the leg. Okay, so founded in 1974, Clean Water Fund is a national 501c3 nonprofit research and education organization. We have field offices in 16 states and a headquarters in Washington, D.C. Clean Water Fund's California program was founded in 1990 and pursues initiatives that protect public health and the environment through improving water quality. We have a track record of educating the public about trash and waterways eliminating plastic pollution, and reducing single-use packaging and disposable products that impact water quality. Clean Water Fund's programs build on and complement those of Clean Water Action, a 1 million member strong national 501c4 environmental advocacy organization. We care because we came to this issue through the lens of marine debris, which is trash and plastics filling our oceans. In the 1950s, the plastics and chemical industries sold the American public on the convenience of single-use disposable items, which has resulted in environmental and economic consequences today that are only accelerating. It takes resources like water, energy, trees, and petroleum to manufacture, distribute, and dispose of all the single-use disposable packaging items we find in food service these days. And there are environmental and economic impacts at every step of the linear life cycle of a disposable product from extraction to disposal. 
Americans generate approximately 250 million tons of garbage a year. The majority of it, 200 million tons, is considered, quote unquote, non-durable. That is mostly single-use throwaway products. Plastics are the fastest growing form of packaging, and the vast majority of marine debris is plastic, approximately 60 to 80 percent. And 80 percent of marine debris comes from trash and urban runoff. According to the 2016 World Economic Forum report titled, The New Plastics Economy, Rethinking the Future of Plastics, there will be more plastic and weight than fish in the oceans by 2050. So it turns out that the away in throwaway is often not where we want or expect it to be. As you can see from this graph, managing all of this stuff, single-use stuff, is harder than we thought. Plastics are hard to recycle. They're often mixed with other materials or too contaminated to recycle. Here we can see that recycling really is a challenge. The top line is showing the increasing quantity of plastic stuff being generated each year as more and more products are being made of plastic and we're consuming more and more of them. The bottom line is showing the recovery rate. That's incineration and recycling, and it's less than 5%. And while generation is increasing substantially, recovery simply isn't keeping up. So the big question is, how do we address that generation rate? We're just producing and consuming too much, and it's a senseless form of consumption of resources. Most of these products found in food service industry are used for five to 10 minutes and then thrown out and becomes an end of life material to manage. Litter control methods, like installing more trash and recycling receptacles, beach and waterway cleanups, street sweeping, installation of storm drain trash capture devices and maintenance of those devices. They try to manage and control the problem, not really solve it. And they're costly and not always effective. The state of California is spending almost half a billion dollars to prevent trash from entering our waterways. And cleanup has to be ongoing because the source of litter is continually washing down the watershed. So Rethink Disposable focuses on reducing the consumption side or that generation rate I just talked about in the last slide. Reducing at the source can also reduce the cost to clean up and manage all this debris and trash. And this approach is called source reduction. So source reduction addresses how much waste is generated in the first place and is the most preferred method to any zero waste and even conventional waste management hierarchy. Let's make sure that we're all on the same page. Source reduction is not talking about recycling and composting. That falls into the category of end of life materials management. Source reduction means you don't have waste to manage because you're generating it in the first place. If there's less waste to manage, there's less to capture and control for the water quality folks, there's or less to divert from landfill for the zero waste folks. And we recognize that source reduction isn't the only method um, to making change and you know, solve this problem, but it's definitely part of a suite of solutions and should be the first stop. In order to address marine debris issues from a source reduction perspective, we had to figure out where is all this trash coming from? So we looked for two types of data products that end up in our waterways, and where those products are actually coming from. We searched marine debris literature and beach debris and stormwater. We couldn't find any data that try to answer the question of what are the sources of marine debris. We found data on the types of products, the best example being International Coastal Cleanup Day data, as you can see from this um, CCD top 10 list from 2015. Everyone knows that cigarette butts are the most prolific item collected on CCD each year, right? But if you look at this data from a source reduction lens, where do you go to to stop the problem? Look at the top 10 items originate. Eight of the top 10 items are food and beverage packaging, which comprises 66% of the total materials removed, total material and debris removed. Butts are 28% and plastic bags are 12%. So if you want to employ source reduction and get the biggest bang for the buck, you need to focus on the food and beverage packaging category. And here's the problem. We can't tell from this data where did that food and beverage packaging come from. We know people consume those products, but where did they get them? What sources? What businesses? What locations? If we're going to stop the use of these things at the source, then we need to know what the sources are. So that's exactly what 
Clean Water Fund and Clean Water Action set out to do in 2011. And in partnership with five San Francisco Bay Area local governments, we conducted a street litter survey in areas that are known to contribute trash to highly impacted creeks and rivers that enter the San Francisco Bay. These quote unquote hot spots were identified by our local agency partners. We had considered monitoring trash in storm drains, but there are two problems with that. First, after sitting in water, storm drain trash is too degraded to be able to effectively identify what kinds of products are accumulating. And second, trash collected in a storm drain trash capture device could have really entered the storm drain at a very distant point in the watershed and almost anywhere. So you aren't collecting data close to the source. So we decided to collect street litter data in areas where street litter was either blowing into a creek or nearby waterway or entering the storm drain and then impacting that local creek. We wanted to know more than what types of products, as I mentioned before, we wanted to identify where the products originated from so we could go to the source to reduce them. So we checked brand names and other identifying factors. And of the 11,000 total pieces of litter we collected and analyzed, 19% of the litter collected was identifiable and known sources. When the results were organized by source, half is from fast food, and altogether takeout related food business comprises 81% of the sources of street litter. So that last slide uh, depicted the data results by source, but when the data results were organized by product type, 67% was food and beverage packaging, not including cigarette butts. Does that number sound familiar? That almost matches the 66% of food and beverage packaging found on the beaches from 2015 Coastal Cleanup Day data. So applying a source reduction lens to the data, we asked ourselves what percent could be replaced by reusable products? 27% of food packaging could be replaced by reusable containers, and 13% of beverage packaging could be replaced by reusable beverage containers. So altogether, we could reduce litter by as much as 40% if we eliminated the disposable food and beverage packaging products. Obviously, we will never completely eliminate these products, but our goal has become to focus on reduction and minimization of these products. Now, armed with the data to understand the problem, the Rethink Disposable campaign is launched with grant and foundation funding in 2012, and we currently have eight Go, Bay Area City and County partners in zero waste and stormwater programs. The program has three primary goals. First, to engage the takeout food businesses and institutions with food service to voluntarily implement rethink disposable source reduction best management practices. Second, we are assisting local jurisdictions in developing new source reduction strategies that benefit their zero waste and stormwater trash and litter reduction programs. There's actually an incentive for local governments to partner with us on this program to help them, to support them achieve mandatory compliance in California. There's a new statewide mandate to eliminate 100% of trash in waterways by 2022 for the Bay Area and 2026 for California as a state. And an aggressive 75% diversion of materials from landfill by 2020. Clean Water is also pursuing local policies and regulatory options to banning and charging for litter-prone disposable packaging and has supported legislation um, both local at the state level, local, state, and national level on, for example, plastic bag bans, foam foodware container bans, and microbeads. And third, we are educating the public and takeout food customers about the trash impacts from litter related to food service packaging. So Rethink Disposables trained auditors. So now I'm going to laser focus kind of into the food service business work. Um, Rethink Disposables trained auditors work with participating businesses and institutions to implement best management practices. I will use the acronym BMP probably going forward. All disposable packaging targeted for reduction and elimination is tracked and measured through an audit process that we have developed and refined and program impacts like disposable packaging reduction, waste prevention, and cost savings after payback period are calculated and reported um, at the completion of a business's participation in the program. 
I want to be really clear, though, that we do not make recommendations for alternative recyclable or compostable food serviceware items. This is a very common request and a very common misconception in our program. Our position is that any packaging item that comes from resources generates greenhouse gas emissions along the entire linear supply chain from extraction to disposal, is designed to be used once, and then becomes a material to manage in its end of life, still qualifies as a single-use disposable product. Business owners spend three to, five, three to four times more per item for some of these compostable packaging products used in food service. Many businesses don't even have access to commercial compost collection or contract haulers that don't accept those materials in their commercial compost streams. And not to mention, there is no certification for marine degradability of these compostable bioplastics. So I want to be really transparent, though, that it's not like we walk into a business and everyone is jumping on the bandwagon and signing up. Um, it's not easy to get a business to sign up, and it sometimes takes multiple visits, and sometimes you really have to craft the message and the pitch um, to the business owner in a way that's going to resonate with them. So finding the right hook, because for them, change can be really scary. This is a cultural shift that we're trying to start here with the food service industry. So sometimes they want to do changes um, to reduce packaging in baby steps. And sometimes they just don't want us to get in the storage room to do their data counting on the disposable products for the audit. So auditors work with the owners um, you know, very individually to show them that cost savings projections that can be achieved after payback period if they minimize disposable packaging and potentially transition to reusable alternatives. We help them rework their operational flow and provide technical expertise offer a reusable product incentive mini grant to get them um, up and off the ground and start you know, implementing the program to offset some setup costs. We help them understand the environmental benefit of reuse and generally make the case that at the end of the day, it's just not smart business practice to spend all this money to purchase and continually restock thousands of disposables weekly, have your customers use them for a few minutes, and then you pay again to haul them away. Here's a little flow chart for you that explains the audit process. And actually, one thing I realized I'm missing the pre-application bubble, which is um, outreach, business outreach and engagement. So our auditors really go out there. They first work with the local city government to identify high trash generating management areas in commercial districts. Um, those are our target spots to do business outreach and engagement and try to have businesses change disposable packaging practices. So for this outreach, we do a lot of grassroots canvassing, going and observing the businesses, eating at the businesses, looking in their trash, taking some pictures, and um, trying to assess out if the owner is someone who's available and receptive to the message. And in the pilot phase of our program, we were really developing this audit process. We found that it took about um, 10 business touches to get down to one business to actually sign up and participate in the program. And that's a timely process. But now that we've streamlined the process, we've gotten better at our audit because we've learned from our lessons in the pilot phase and now we're really um, implementing on, in a new county in Santa Clara County with three local city partners there. We've seen um, better coordination with the local government partners to promote the program. And this last round is showing about a six to one ratio of business touches to business uh, sign up and participation. So once we get a business to sign up, uh, they fill out the application and based on the auditor's recommendations, they choose which uh, best management practices they would like to implement from a list of options. And they also are required to implement five standard minimum practices. Once the application is filled out and we know which disposable packaging items we will be targeting for reduction, then a baseline inventory of that disposable packaging item is taken for about a two-week snapshot. Um, we help them make the changes. We provide technical assistance. That comes in a variety of forms. If there is funding available, we purchase the um, reusable products uh, for them up to a certain amount. And then the auditor will come back, verify that all the changes have been implemented and, and are, you know, in process, are done and implemented. And then we come back again and we take a follow-up data inventory, counting in the exact same method of the same disposable packaging items that we were targeting for reduction, 
all those numbers are plugged into our calculator. Um, the auditor goes into the business to install business recognition materials and customer education signage throughout the inside of the business operation. And we go back to the business owner at the end and we collect a follow-up survey because we want to continually hear from our business owners to understand how we can refine and make the program better and more user-friendly and simplified. And finally, the auditor submits a final report package to Clean Water Fund, which includes the audit calculator, the final report, the um, business survey, and photo documentation of the process. So I had to throw this slide in here. I'm going to do a quick time check. Oh, we're looking good. Okay. I had to throw this slide in there because, um, you know, not only are we always hitting up with a common misconception about, oh, I don't have single-use disposables here in my business. I'm using compostables. So that's one um, issue and misconception that we're constantly trying to work with the business owners to help them understand um, the true issue there. But also water usage. Uh, when we walk into businesses, especially in California in a drought, and we say, hey, we think you should reduce packaging, but maybe you could also go to a reusable alternative, they're really concerned about increasing water usage required to wash and continually reuse through their operations those um, reuse or durable packaging items. So I wanted to highlight this study that was done, um, and I also want to say that's a valid and totally um, normal concern, and we almost hear it from every single business that we engage, not all the time, but almost always. And um, this study shows that this was done with the Starbucks Coffee Company and the Alliance for Environmental Innovation Joint Task Force. A little outdated in 2000, but I think that the, um, the concept is still there, which is that they did a study of the life cycle analysis of ceramic, paper, glass, PET, plastic, cups from the extraction of raw materials to their manufacturer use and disposable. The alliance found that the break-even point between which environmental benefits began to accrue was approximately 70 uses for ceramics and 36 uses for glass. So let's think about that for a second. If you look at one disposable PET uh, lined, you know, hot paper coffee cup, uh, and you have to use that 3,000 times versus one reusable ceramic mug that is designed for 3,000 uses. Yes, when you compare it one to one, the disposable packaging product wins um, in the environmental fight. But when you look at uh, the reusable and compare to the disposable, it slowly starts to win once you hit the break even point and inch away. So for example, with ceramic, it's 70 uses. With glass, it's 36 uses. And it's actually been found that if you implement ceramic reusables, looking at the entire life cycle of the packaging product, water usage actually decreases by 64% according to this study. So here's what some of our rethink disposable recommendations may look like. Um, we could eliminate individually wrapped items and replace with bulk alternatives. We eliminate non-necessary disposable items or make them available by request only, like, for example, straws and drink stirs. Instead of automatically handing out optional disposable items like lids, sleeves, condiments, napkins, um, straws, we request that an owner organize that stuff into a self-service station area and let, instead of automatically giving it to the customer, let the customer choose for themselves what they really need and place some really awesome signage that we have created um, next to the self-service station that reminds them really with a take only what you need message. And we ask businesses to offer and advertise a reusable cup and container incentive for to-go foodware. While the previous slide shows that we, that is a major focus on reduction and minimization, um, we also implement the program in this particular way where we could transition one to all of the disposable packaging to reusable packaging. Um, in this particular case, this is a business in Alameda County. They actually won a Stop Waste Business Efficiency Award for their achievements in waste reduction. And here was a business owner when we first walked in the door, they said, we're doing everything right because on the top photo you're seeing these are all single use. BPI certified compostables. And that was the representation of one person's pile of trash left over from one meal. Um, so as you can see, the bottom photo shows the transition of what the um, foodware products that were being implemented post rethink disposable participation. We've got a real glass cup, a stainless steel ramekin for 
side sauce. You've got, um, she removed the paper box that the uh, sandwich came in all together, or she makes an amazing fried uh, <laughs> mac and cheese there too, and got stainless steel. And what, the greatest story that came out of this um, Business of Sacred Wheels participation, and there's a case study and a video about her uh, participation in Rethink Disposable on our website, which I'll share at the end. Um, she actually thought, wow, I thought I was doing everything right. I didn't really want to make the change, but once I did it, I realized not only do I love the presentation of my food, um, you know, looks elevated, and she loves seeing photos of it actually online and Yelp, for example, because she thinks it actually sells her, her business better. And the cool story here is that um, her silverware, actually once her customers started seeing the changes and realizing what was happening, they kind of jumped on the bandwagon and said, hey, this is awesome, let us support you. So she has one customer that has donated all of the reusable salt and pepper shakers that are all cute and mismatched um, inside the food business. And also the silverware was all donated from an old uh, cruise ship line that was going out of business. So that was kind of an interesting piece of that story. I wanted to highlight for you here our first institutional uh, Rethink Disposable pilot project. This was at the high school, uh, Bishop O'Dowd High School in Oakland, California. They serve about 450 hot lunch meals per day. And they work with a very sustainably minded locally, uh, local food service business, cater, like a catering company. And we came in there, we said, okay, waste prevention, let's think about what we can do here on campus. And we looked at food service and we looked at their front and back of the house operations and we talked to the chef, we talked to facilities, we talked to the sustainability director on campus. And what we found was that, uh-oh, their kitchen is kind of outdated from the 30s and they have zero dishwashing capacity other than a three sink system and they really have no additional storage space. But they still were really passionate about making the change. So we worked with them, we said, what can we do? Talked to the chef, we found out that 80 to 90% of their daily food service menu cover items were something that could be serviced by a reusable basket. So we worked with the chef, we worked with the school, we got 500 reusable baskets, we got uh, rolling carts with bus tubs and signage for students to deposit dirty baskets after lunch service. And um, our baseline of inventory of their disposable paper plate usage found that they were using over 123,000 disposable plates during an average school year. Once we implemented this program and this pilot project, we saw a reduction of 3,376 pounds or 1.69 tons of waste annually from the disposable plates. The school saved after the payback period, which was the cost to purchase the uh, program supplies, after the payback period, they were saving almost $6,500 annually. And uh, this school actually won the uh, green ribbon designation from the state of California this year, uh, citing waste prevention through Rethink Disposal as one of their primary uh, metrics for sustainability. I, oh, and also really quick on the high school, their case study and a video a testimonial about their project is also available online on rethinkdisposable.org. So I wanted to highlight another interesting story here, um, and really I would love to follow up with anyone after this webinar because each individual participant, which now we have about 109 food businesses around the Bay Area, four institutions, um, and one pilot project we did with nine food trucks at a weekly food truck event in the Bay Area, each story, each business, each participant has an interesting story, and each one had their own set of limitations and their own set of challenges, and really coming up with unique, individualized ways that we could provide technical expertise and help them still participate in change and still be a program participant, um, even given the limitations and challenges. So for these two uh, business participants, one thing that we really focused on there was the water station. Um, if you look at Lola's Chicken Shack, um, they were using over 52,000 disposable plastic water cups just for self-serve water inside their restaurant. And Cafe Talavera was using close to 40,000 disposable plastic cups annually. And that cost them a lot of money. I mean, when you are working in the food service industry and the, the um, margin of profit is so small and constantly in flux, Ha saving something like $2,000, $3,000 for a small owner, business owner, is a really exciting thing. 
and can also go, you know, go back into supporting maybe new best management practices, source reduction changes, or maybe even purchase of a really efficient um, dishwasher to help maintain the changes. So for Lola's Chicken Shack, uh, we actually used our grant funds as a mini incentive grant to help them purchase the reusable cups and offset any costs that they had with implementing the program. We saw Lola's reduce their waste by over 1,000 pounds and Cafe Talavera reduce their waste by over seven, about 782 pounds. Now, with Lola's Chicken Shack, um, they were really concerned about water usage, going back to that previous slide where we're thinking about what are all the concerns, what are, what are all the problems and the challenges that the business owners could throw back at us, because now we kind of have a whole arsenal of responses um, based on our experiences and lessons learned so far. And with Lola's Chicken Shack, uh, yes, water use was concerning. So we worked with her and we said, okay, how many cups do you feel that you're going through every day? We found out it was about 100 cups daily. So we went to her dishwasher and we said, okay, how many cups can we fit in a rack? How many racks in a load? How many loads? How many gallons per load? How long is the wash cycle? And long story short, as we found out that she would have to run the dishwasher about three additional loads a day. She's a highly efficient water and energy dishwasher, and that was only going to add about five gallons of additional water usage per day, which is negligible. And we could easily find ways to offset that water usage in other areas of her business. So in our pilot phase, our 2015 program impacts to date, we have 100 participants total. We had 90 food businesses around the Bay Area participate, nine food trucks, as I mentioned, at a weekly uh, food truck event um, in the Bay Area. They implemented a reusable container pilot project for on-site diners and our high school institution. And at the end of the day, when we calculated all uh, program results of just 30 of those 100 participating businesses, we found that we reduced 3 million pieces of disposable food service items are eliminated, like cups, lids, straws, utensils, clamshells, sugar, condiment packets. Um, we saw an average reduction of 70% of the targeted disposable items that we tried to reduce and eliminate. Total waste prevention was 30,000 pounds or 15 tons. And businesses saved on average a little over $3,000. And these are all annual impacts. So as long as the business owner continues and maintains and sustains the changes over time, those are annual impacts. Not only are we changing the business's practices, but we also help them engage their customers inside the business and throughout with some fun and educational signage. For us, um, it was really exciting when our do you really need a straw? Straws are one of the top 10 marine debris items found on our beaches, rethink disposable. This was placed anywhere that if a business owner was unwilling to remove and eliminate and refuse straws altogether, then we requested that they had to put signage where the straws actually are. And so um, this proved to be really effective. And for one business, just ha they wouldn't remove the straws, but just having they used to have straws that are individually wrapped. That got put into a dispenser, so we removed the wrapper, just the straw, <clears throat> excuse me, and then the signage um, showed from the baseline to the follow-up audit <coughs> that we actually reduced straw usage by um, almost 50%. So I'm gonna take a quick water break. <coughs> and I'm back. Um, so we also are engaging the public. We go out and give presentations. We table at tons of events around the Bay Area. We go to conferences. But this particular piece I wanted to share <coughs> because um, Rethink Disposable has a goal to talk to 40,000 people about the impacts of single use in the Bay Area by 2017. Excuse me one second. Okay, <clears throat> I think I'm back. Uh oh. I was hoping this wouldn't happen, but I figured if I talked this long, I might lose my voice. Uh oh. Okay, so this source reduction pledge um, 
is really exciting because we're using it with our work out in the community and we're also helping <clears throat> train watershed groups so that they can use this material when they go out as well. Oops, next slide. Okay, so having come out of our pilot phase, the lessons learned for us, we realized that we've made significant progress <clears throat> and developed a measurable source reduction program that can be replicated and scaled. But we still feel like a fish swimming up a waterfall and we have a lot of work left to do. So what we found, our first lesson learned is that working with the food service industry is challenging and requires significant time and a flexible process. Clean Water Fund listened to these, um, the feedback that we were getting from the auditors and the local government partners and the businesses, and we adapted the audit process so we could make it more streamlined, more flexible. We allowed for businesses if they didn't want to participate um, with data, we said, it's fine. This is still valuable change that you're making there. Let's still, we'll give you the technical assistance. We'll work with you to make the changes. We'll consider you a business participant. We just simply won't track data. And um, while that wasn't, we always went for data if we could, but we allowed for that flexibility because we didn't want to turn a business away just because they didn't like the idea of us coming into their storeroom and counting disposable cups and plates and napkins and, and uh, clamshells, things like that. So um, we responded in that way. We also developed, a we developed numerous new ways to figure out um, how can we collect data without physically counting in their stock rooms. We provided a, a new development with providing some type of small mini grant as a reusable product incentive to help them offset some setup costs. And we got much better at coordinating with our local government partners on media and local promotion. And each auditor, re, each auditor works to provide one-on-one -on -one individualized attention and technical assistance with each owner to provide ways to implement the program and also overcome their challenges and their limitations because I guarantee you, you think you heard of it all, but you haven't. <laughs> um, and really with each business, I mean, they just all have their own unique um, business model and operation going on. So the auditors have to be really flexible and responsive to the owners and they really have developed some really positive relationships with them. Two, corporate chains are the biggest source of disposable packaging and the most challenging to engage. We have made efforts to engage McDonald's at the corporate level. Unfortunately, I don't have any progress to report at this time. We are continuing to uh, build campaigns to work on targeting various fast food corporate chains. Um, but I will say that what's kind of interesting is out of our 109 participating food businesses we have to date, uh, we do have three locally owned franchise chain participants around the Bay Area, including Eric's Deli in Cupertino, and Una Moss in San Jose, and Acybel's Pizza in San Francisco. Three, the best local government partners are the ones who are willing to devote resources to the program and couple with other outreach programs that are similar, providing outreach and technical assistance to uh, food businesses. So for example, uh, local government partners participated in our technical advisory committee, which advised the development and implementation of this entire program and process. Um, we also had you know, when, when local governments were out there in the community doing technical assistance or outreach about, say, green business programs or mandatory organics and, and recycling outreach, um, they also had materials and would make a pitch and were trained to be able to make the pitch about rethink disposables. And four, we recognize that there is a need, a valuable need to correlate the measurable reductions of packaging that we know that we can achieve and um, calculate inside the business with the measurable, measurable reductions of food service litter prone packaging in the environment outside the business. But this really is a challenging uh, project because we need to be able to find a perfect site location where litter is clearly emanating from a food business and impacting a local stream, creek, waterway, or storm drain so we can accurately conduct litter measurements pre and post rethink participation to see if we are indeed positively reducing litter in the environment outside the businesses that have participated in rethink disposable. 
And you ask, what does the future hold for us? Well, um, we will continue to simplify and scale the program. We want to be able to grow into new geographies, and there are plenty of other uh, food service packaging buckets that we would like to be, um, you know, that we've identified as, as issues to target, such as grocery store packaging or um, the explosion of food service delivery, prepackaged food service delivery programs, um, and recognizing that that is definitely an area for opportunity and growth. We also are looking at ways for diversifying our funding, including developing partnership and membership models for local government, NGOs, haulers, and food service providers. We have been working towards and developing communication pieces um, to build a media campaign, really to build branding and awareness of the program, to also educate the general community about the impact of single-use disposable packaging on waterways and marine environments. But also we want to recognize and promote our participating restaurants. Um, one really exciting new future program uh, development that we're in the process right now is developing a greenhouse gas calculator for foodware packaging. This is so exciting because it'll be a new metric that will be added to our audit. So in addition to be able to report to a local government or a funder or a business or an institution, in addition to telling them how many pieces of disposal packaging items did we eliminate from their food service, we can tell them how much waste they've prevented um, from their operations. We can tell them what their cost savings will be, but now we also can associate this new exciting piece, which is have you made uh, carbon emission reductions by implementing source reduction changes? And the preliminary results are, are staggering, and I'm really excited to um, be able to now also report in terms of greenhouse gas emission reductions. And developing the litter reduction monitoring program, as I mentioned in the previous slide. And finally, expanding institutional dining programs. And uh, we have done, we are in process with this. We have three new pilot projects in development. Um, because what we realize with institutions is that you get a really, you know, big bang for the buck. So when we're talking about working with our small locally owned mom and pop food businesses that, you know, have 30 seats and do 180 transactions during a busy lunch rush, we're talking about institutions that serve 42,000 people food on a daily basis, and that's breakfast, lunch, snacks, grab and go, um, event catering. So really we're talking about massive tonnage of reduction and um, millions of pieces of disposal packaging items prevented, and um, this is where we will be testing out our new greenhouse gas calculator for the foodware packaging. I want to stop to acknowledge and thank our past and current program funders and partners without which this project, of course, would not be possible. We're always looking for new partnerships to expand the impact and geographic scope of the campaign. So, yes, that is me. Um, <laughs> please visit us online at rethinkdisposable.org to view program resources, like the eight case studies of various food service business participants we are, um, we've put together to date, and the five business video testimonials. By the summertime, we will also have new reusable versus disposable life cycle analysis fact sheets available. We welcome you to join the discussion on social media, and contact me if you have any questions or interest in pursuing Rethink Disposable projects or want more information about how to become a member organization. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for bearing with me through my uh, minor lo loss of voice. And um, with that, I would love to take some questions. Awesome. Well, I got the questions pulled up back here on the back end. Uh, hi, everyone. This is Nick Weiner from MarineDebris.info. I guess I should introduce myself. Um, so just a reminder, you can ask questions in the uh, GoToWebinar control panel there. Just go to the little questions app. And you just type in a question. That'll come into me, and then I can relay those to Samantha. Um, so just quick housekeeping note, um, we have a note here about a report from Keep America Beautiful uh, from 2009 on uh, the sources of trash, transition points, etc. 
uh, which we'll put in the comments of the webinar archive uh, so you all can get that. Um, let's see. So we have a question here about um, encouraging the use of cellulose and corn starch types of plastics. Um, is that something that is like aligned with this program? Uh, how do those kind of like fit in with the disposable, like is compostable like part of the disposable method or not so much? Sure. Yeah, um, that is a wonderful question and a question that we get all the time and a very common misconception of our program, which is that our, our take on it is that any material that comes from resources has environmental impacts throughout the life cycle of, its, of the product and is designed really for one-time use and then becomes an end-of-life material to manage is really, in our mind, still a single-use disposable packaging item and is not the type of recommendations that we make in our program, especially because the food businesses are spending anywhere between two to four times more per packaging item to purchase a BPI-certified um, compostable material. A lot of business owners in California, yes, I think we have a lot of commercial compost collection programs, I don't think that that's the case across the country, and some of our business owners still don't have commercial compost collection, and their haulers have specifically told them that they can no longer put bioware, bioplastics, uh, corn starch, potato starch, whatever, whatever you, um, mature, the PLA materials that you want to call it, they're not accepting them in the commercial compost stream. So, um, so in our program, long story short is that no, we do not make recommendations for compostable products. Thank you. Um, and I think you somewhat addressed this earlier, but do you have a sense of the hours and dollars per pound of waste reduced? The hours and dollars per pound of waste, so like cost of program implementation, is that sound like um, I think it's. I think it goes back to the slide you had where you're talking about um, basically like the return on investment for like how long it takes people when they switch over um, to like start saving money. Um, so I think you guys do from looking at that slide, but... Um, I would say there's no real easy one perfect answer to, to provide for that because it's unique to each business. So if a business, we walk into a Cactus Taqueria and they do 800 transactions a day versus, um, you know, our local um, lunch spot here in Oakland, California who does maybe 80, 50 to 80 transactions during lunch, busy lunch rush. So depending on the um, magnitude of service and also the types of materials that they are changing, that would impact you know, all of those numbers. So whoever asked that question, I'd be happy to uh, connect with you offline about that. Okay. Uh, actually, they just clarified here. Uh, what they meant was uh, how much does the program cost per pound reduced? So not at the store level, but I guess like in terms of like how much uh, it costs you guys mm, on average. I see. I see. Uh, costs us. Well, um, hmm. I think that that's, that that's kind of internal information for us, but should anyone have interest in implementing the program either at their institution or through a local government partnership, we would develop a proposal with a scope of services and a budget that would fit for those, that particular need of that project. So um, again, I welcome that person to reach out to me. And we are actually in the face of one of the feedback when we wrapped the, you know, the pilot and the development phase of this project, one of the pieces of feedback that we got, which is really valuable from a local government partners, stormwater folks want to know, you know, what's the, what's the value of this program of material removed uh, from the environment, you know, what's the cost of impl implementation by material removed um, or litter reduced in the environment? And for the zero waste and waste management folks, they want to know cost of program implementation per tonnage diverted, um, which is hard because there's really no um, precedence set for diversion right now. We're focused heavily in, even in California, on diversion through aggressive composting and recycling activities. Um, so that's something that we actually have been requested by our local government partners, and we are working on that piece now. Awesome. 
Uh, so we have a question here, uh, which I think is like relating to all the plastic bag bans we've been doing here on the mm -hmm. West Coast and pushback from mm -hmm. corporations for doing so. Uh, have you sure. guys received any pushback from corporations uh, from the dis like disposable waste industry uh, or pa disposable mm -hmm. packaging industry? Have we received pushback from the disposable packaging industry? I'm, you know, we're small but mighty, but um, <laughs> To this, but other than bag bans, which our Clean Water Action um, sister organization is heavily involved in um, protecting the statewide bag ban in California and uh, working on the bag ban referendum. So, you know, uh, but other than that, I, I have not received any death threats <laughs> or hate mail, but um, I would imagine that the more and more we try to engage up the ladder with the corporate chains, um, it might get a little bit more sticky. Awesome. That's. Good news so far. <laughs> uh, do you have any ideas for drive-through restaurants? Uh, huh. Like, <sighs> that's funny. Okay, yes. <laughs> do I have uh, any ideas for drive-through restaurants? Yes, yes. In terms hmm. of uh, like usage of straws, napkins, little ketchup containers, things like that. Interesting. Drive-through. I don't know if I can speak to you at this moment, but for you know the actual, you can request to not get those things, right? So as the customer, you can refuse certain items. For the chain restaurants, what we've found is that, um, you know, they're actually able to make some small scale changes within their own restaurant, as long as it's not coming down from corporate and not logoed with the company's uh, branding all over it. So, but for the, um, you know, for, one last thing I would mention about foodware packaging that I didn't plug before is another piece that Clean Water is developing right now is a white paper. It's a toxics in packaging food report um, where we're actually finding, not just looking at, so if I didn't make the case already about all of the uh, waste and cost savings and packaging reduction and litter reduction and waste reduction um, and now greenhouse gas emission reductions, you know, I also can share with you that our findings are showing that there are significant toxic chemicals that are in the packaging and migrate into our food. So if there's another piece of the puzzle here to reduce packaging, it's the contamination issue. Perfect. Uh, so we have some questions yeah. here about the webinar recording. Uh, so just FYI to everyone, we are recording this right now. Um, I'll have this archived on marinedebris.info in about an hour and a half. Uh, and if you're on the marinedebris.info mailing list, uh, we'll send out a link there too, so you all can watch it right there. Uh, we'll also have links to, um, actually, Samantha, can you send me an email with the Life Cycle Analysis 2000 study link uh, so I can put oh, that sure. in the archive? Thank you. And I will okay. also um, put a link to the Keep America Beautiful report in there as well. Um, okay, uh, so are you aware of similar programs in other states? Uh, and this is asking in particular for Texas as well. For Texas? Hmm. Slash well, Washington, we do have a I mean, <laughs> yeah, um, anywhere else on the West Coast, too. Had actually to be honest with you, that. I'm aware of campaigns that are activating in local communities, grassroots style, to um, really try to change food service industry by requesting that they refuse some heavily litter-prone um, packaging items that we see in food service. I know that there are some small movements happening, especially like with straws, for example, and, and bags. And um, But as far as the ability to, quanti to um, track metrics and to quantify program impacts that are reportable and, and replicable, um, to focus on prevention of waste and materials and litter prone packaging. I'm not aware of any other program that does what we do. Well, that's definitely news for everybody else here to But I'd love up. to hear more <laughs> if there's another program out there that's um, doing, doing what we're doing. I'd love to partner and, and learn more about how we can best share um, efforts. Awesome. I yeah, am aware yeah, of plenty of aggressive composting and recycling programs. I come from a very heavy zero waste focused background, um, but I, you know, I'm not sure of the, from the source reduction waste prevention side if it's being quantified and uh, calculated. Okay. Uh, so yeah, so there are a bunch of questions here just asking about like your organization and how you guys got mm -hmm. started. Um, are you guys like uh, getting primarily funding from the government there, or are you more like grant oriented? Mm -hmm. 
Sure. Um, well, we could skip back a quick second here to our funders and partners. So um, we've had, you know, US EPA grants. We, we had the um, San Francisco Bay Water Quality Improvement Fund grant, which really was a piece of a suite of grants that we had that kind of launched and incubated the program. Um, we now have an EPA Pollution Prevention Source Reduction Assistance Grant that is doing the work with the institutions and development of the Greenhouse Gas Calculator. We've had grants from Alameda County Stop Waste, uh, water, Clean Water Programs, Community Stewardship Grant, California Coastal Commission, Watershed Districts. Uh, we've definitely had wonderful foundation uh, support. We've also had um, some corporate sponsorships like with Clean Canteen and uh, Cliff Bar. Um, we currently have a NOAA Marine Debris Prevention Through Education Grant. And now moving forward, going back one more slide, um, as part of our diversifying the funding portfolio, yes, we're continually seeking grants and we're continually seeking uh, foundation and corporate support um, with, with corporations that are aligned with our mission. Um, and really now it's about how do we develop partnership and, and membership models for our current local government partners and moving forward with new local government partners and other non-government non organizations and also even haulers have requested if they can offer this program as like a, a piece of the suite of you know program offerings that they give to food businesses um, and also the food service providers themselves thinking about you know some of the mega national food service providers like Compass or um, you know we have partnerships with a national food service provider, Bon Appetit. Um, that's going to be a really exciting development to help us grow into the institutional market. Excellent. I think I answered that question. Yeah, yeah, no, that was perfect. <laughs> okay. uh, let's see, it looks like we have time for one final question here, and this one is uh, asking about uh, volunteers. And uh, like, it's everybody mm. that does all this outreach work with the restaurants. Oh. Uh, are you all on staff at the organization? Or oh, yes. do you have like a whole team of volunteers that are going out there also talking with restaurants mm. trying to get people engaged? Mm, that's a great question. Um, so, you know, because this program is so innovative and new and kind of an exciting um, arena to really focus on waste prevention and litter prevention, um, we've been able to grow our staff actually. Um, our, our state director, Miriam Gordon, kind of created this program in 2011 that was launched with the litter um, study, the Bay Area Litter Study and Characterization. And then now we've been able to grow our staff to three full-time um, people. And we've also worked uh, with local governments. Their time on the project has been through Match. And also sometimes they hire their own consultants that are already going out there into the field to do business outreach and engagement and technical assistance, um, they will pay their consultants to actually go out and implement Rethink Disposal with training from us. And regarding volunteers, we are about to engage the community now. So that was for really the food service businesses and the institutions. But for the community piece, um, we're going to be hosting a Bay Area watershed workshop and training about Rethink Disposal source reduction messaging and materials in June. Uh, we're inviting um, champions and leaders in watershed issues from all over the Bay Area. And basically, we are going to be training them to be our eyes and ears and um, you know, education arm out into the field so we can leverage our impact and our reach. Um, so they'll be getting our materials. They'll be activating the source reduction pledge um, throughout the year at all of their events and cleanups and we're going to be providing support to them. So I would assume that they would be like um, wonderful volunteers that are helping us spread the source reduction message. Awesome. Well, uh, Sherry and Erica, do you guys have anything else to add before we wrap up? Um, no, I think just, just a thank you to MarineW.info and Nick for hosting us and to Samantha for a great presentation. Awesome. Yes, yeah, Samantha, thank you so much for this. This was really, really informative. And, uh, Thank you. Definitely, Please you know, uh, don't be a stranger. And um, my contact information is on this last slide at summer at cleanwater.org. And thank you all so much for your time. Awesome. All right. Thank you all so much. Have a good day. Okay. Bye-bye.